Okay. Thanks a lot, Anne. Um, and I, th I think when I go to sharing the screen that I won't be able to see anybody. Is that right? Uh, we'll just have yeah, a go at that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll go right to sharing the screen. Make sure we can actually do that. Okay, now I, and how is that? Can you see my screen, everybody? Yes, that looks great. Okay. Oh, those of you that know me would, <laughs> I have down here in my, uh, my notes that I would like to start with a group hug. <laughs> it's, um, it's true, I have spent quite a bit of time in the past week or so, um, working on this talk and I'm I'm very grateful for the opportunity to um, <clears throat> share some of my stories about our trip to St. Lawrence Island. I looked up the uh, the traditional name for St. Lawrence Island is Sivugak and I changed the title of my talk to include that. Um, we were there in uh, mid-July 2013. So it was about seven years ago. And um, working on going back to the photos of, of that week there, I realized that, you know, when we go there for work, we, it's a pretty intense time. And we focus on collecting the aerial imagery and delivering it to the office when we get back. And I really didn't take a lot of time to look at things um, really carefully and I really haven't gone back to uh, let's see here I haven't gone back to look at the photos uh, really since then and I was remembering I had lots of questions about uh, things that we saw and um, so I've been able to go back and and take a closer look and look stuff up um, I wanted to jump right in with um, uh, how we got to the island, uh, let's see here, starting off with just acknowledging all the people that helped to get us there. Um, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, I wanna start with, oh, and really the most important reason we went to St. Lawrence Island for our work was to uh, look at shoreline and coastline. And that's really the focus of our survey was on the coastline. So I'm gonna talk a, about the coastline and about the birds that we were able to see and the landscape and a little bit about the people. And hopefully I'll leave you completely uh, overstimulated and full of lots of questions about the place. Um, uh, here's uh, just to get you oriented about where St. Lawrence Island is. I took this map from the splash page for the ShoreZone online website. And if you could see my cursor there, I'm just uh, circling St. Lawrence Island. All the coastline in red on Alaska here has been surveyed uh, with our coastal mapping ShoreZone technique and most of it's been classified as well. We're down here under the P of place. And you can never have too many maps. I love maps. So I wanted to show you how close St. Lawrence Island is here to Russia. And it's also very close to the international date line. And we could have a glimpse of Russia when we were over at the uh, west side of the island here. We got to the island by taking commercial airline to Nome, Alaska, which is over here, the Gold Rush and the Iditarod sled dog race on the coastline of Nome. And you can see that it's actually further from Nome to St. Lawrence Island than it is from St. Lawrence Island to, uh, to Siberia. Um, and I included, uh, let's see here, uh, the latitude of St. Lawrence Island is about similar to Yellowknife and the southern end of Baffin Island, but it's uh, 
further, it's as far west from BC as Ottawa is east of us. So just to kind of position it in the world. Vancouver Island is much bigger than St. Lawrence Island. St. Lawrence Island is only is about 160 kilometers total length and Vancouver Islands over four and a half, uh, 450 kilometers. I wanted to include this shot from Google Earth just to show the how close uh, St. Lawrence Island is to the Bering Strait. So this is the only connection from the North Pacific to the Arctic. You can imagine how dynamic the oceanography is here. And um, I was able to look up some maps of the ice extent at this time and the ice front comes down here just south of St. Lawrence Island and that's really um, pivotal, pivotal to how people lived on the island on St. Lawrence Island because they were they depended on the marine mammals that are associated with the ice edge um, so right now the ice edge is just south of St. Lawrence Island and then as the season warms in the spring, it'll retreat to the north. And a close up, I wanted to show you the, that there was three airstrips that we used on, on the island here. The main town of Savunga is right here um, on the North Shore. And the town of Gamble is on the far west end right here on this corner. This site over here where we actually had fuel for one of our surveys was uh, an, old, uh, an old military installation that was being refurbished. It was a contaminated site, but there was still a camp there and we could have fuel there. So just at first glance, you can see that the island is, is kind of half water <laughs> um, and with a few mountainous bits in, the, in between. Um, you can really see it on this topographic map here. So um, it's a combination of this extremely steep and rugged uh, mountains, really, and in between a lot of water and, and wetlands, um, boggy places. Uh, and I wanted to just read a, an old story from this book here that was uh, gifted to me by one of the guys in in Savunga. Um, this is in the introduction. It's an older book uh, from 1977. And it's a compilation of old story, traditional stories from, from uh, Sugugak. Uh, ages and ages ago, the Eskimo people say a great giant lived in the far north. I'm just going to go back to the map here. One day he happened to be standing with one foot on the Siberian coast and the other on the shores of Alaska. The two continents are not very far apart there. So the giant stood comfortably looking out over the world. As it happened, he chanced to look down at the narrow strip of water between his feet, nonchalantly reached down, took up a handful of the sand and stone of the ocean's bed. He stood looking at it and idly squeezed the water from it. Then he raised his great arm threw the handful of dirt and rock out before him into the water. It stayed there, an island between the two continents. Many centuries later, the island was found by white men and named St. Lawrence Island because they sighted it on that saint's day, August 8, 1728. But the island's own people, uh, the Inuit people, it is still Savugak, meaning literally squeezed. And just looking at the map there, you can see how that's, you know, that story could be true. <laughs> and a little bit of detail of the area where we were based here. Here's Savunga um, on the North Shore. And I wanted to highlight that there's a lot of old names and camps all along the coastline. And in some of the pictures, you'll see. Uh, remains of those old camps and lots of places where the local people go working right now. And all these steep uh, mountains here at the, behind Savu, uh, Savunga, uh, they bring their own weather system. And you can see their, 
they're conical shaped and I'll show you some pictures of those. So let's, let's go to Savunga. You can see there's older, older uh, houses along the water and newer houses and these pipes over land. Um, and the airport is right here. So this is the entire, the entire village. The school is over at this end here. So the first thing uh, we are getting settled here, uh, we stayed at the house uh, uh, right next to City Hall. This is City Hall on the right. And there, I think there was a meeting going on. So there's not many big vehicles there, but lots of uh, beach buggy, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> four wheelers. And that's what people use to get around, bombing around at all hours. Here's a view of the main street um, and the place we stayed was right there. So it was right in downtown. Uh, we were greeted by Myron, the mayor, and uh, he made sure that we were well taken care of. And in fact, gave us a great big piece of fresh halibut when we arrived. And uh, he, said to, uh, he said to us that we could expect that we'd get lots of people coming to the door, lots of visitors from people wanting to sell us carvings and talk about their art. And that was true. Um, we went over towards the coast to see the guys coming in from halibut uh, fishing. There's actually a commercial fishery going on at that time. And uh, they have all these matching uh, boats and motors and there's no harbor. Uh, a few a few of the boats had trailers and here's a, a real contrast of the modern boats on the trailers next to uh, the frame of a traditional traditional angiac, which is the skin boats. They used to be have a wooden frame like this and walrus skin angiac. And the way the guys get the boats in and out of the water right now, they put skids down on, on the beach and that's exactly how they used to bring the traditional boats in and out. And Savunga and, and St. Lawrence Island in, in general is known as the walrus capital of the world. And the only sign I could fine for this was the one from the, the sewer plant, um, which I wanted to include just to show that um, having a, a functioning utility system, it's kind of a big deal. And it's complicated in these tiny remote places. Uh, the guys were always working on the pipes and I think it must be an ongoing problem, just keeping the basic necessities of life going. And the other thing we noticed right away on our first evening walking around town is that there's a lot of evidence of the, uh, the bowhead whale harvest, the traditional harvest. Uh, that, that's John beside uh, a skull there just to show you how, how big it is. Um, and there is traditional harvest from both uh, Savonga and Gamble and I was able to look up information about the oversight of the subsistence harvest for all the Arctic communities. And in 2018, uh, three whales were taken in uh, St. Lawrence Island. Apparently it's usually in a spring hunt and the whales follow the ice edge uh, in migration back and forth past with the seasons past the islands. Um, there was a lot of pieces of baleen uh, uh, around. This, this is a huge chunk that was just on the boat ramp near where the boats were going in and out. And uh, they, this is al almost four meters long. So what we're looking at is the 
the end of it that was attached to the roof of the mouth. So it hangs from the mouth of the long skinny snout of the bowhead and hangs down. Uh, I looked up um, a sketch of the of the bowheads and the, the head makes up like half of the body length and it has this enormous mouth with the, the baleen hanging down. So for the, the population of bowhead in this area of the Arctic is actually increasing in numbers. Um, it's not listed as endangered, but it is a species of special concern. There's, there's different populations across the Arctic which are uh, considered endangered. They're very long lived animals except, and here's a carcass that was still near the beach. I wondered why they didn't uh, tow it out or further offshore and apparently they do, but as the carcass decays, it come, they tend to come back ashore. And there was actually two different ones that came and went from the beach when we were there. And as I was looking at this, there's a couple species of gull here and um, some fulmars out over behind. I didn't realize there were fulmars with them. So there's glaucous gulls, herring gulls, and some fulmars off. Uh, how are we doing, everybody? This is really weird. It's like talking in a closet. <laughs> I can't see anybody's faces. Oh. It is a little strange the time you do this. Yeah. Well, thank you for your reassurance. It's nice to know that there's somebody actually there. All right, so here's the result of all the planning that went into getting us uh, to, to the island. Uh, our little Robinson R44 helicopter, that's John is with his foot in the door, me in the middle and our pilot, Corey, on the outside. Uh, it's not trivial to get a helicopter to St. Lawrence Island. It meant a long overwater crossing from Nome is something that's not normally done. The pilots took extra precautions, carried a life raft and so on. There's no aircraft that are actually based in uh, Savonga. Uh, the only reason that we could arrange to get a helicopter over there for this week of survey was that there was a couple of other uh, crews working on projects there. Uh, another crew was doing a different type of coastal survey and there was also a bone crew, the land management uh, agency that was doing something about repeaters up on the mountains. So we were, we had to share our helicopter time around between them. And that meant some uh, logistical challenges. The summer daylight, uh, daytime, day length is really long there. It, it was sunrise at 5.30 and sunset after midnight. So. We had 18 hours of daylight and were able to uh, fly on into the evening, which we did a couple of times. Here's our pilot. We had a we had to park the helicopter in the the hangar slash uh, greater parking building just so that the kids would <laughs> nobody would be uh, uh, bothering the helicopter. Um, every time we came in or the kids all came running over to hang out and ask us questions. And the little guy in the front there is helping with carrying my flight suit back. But uh, we were in the strange position of, of having all our service, you know, our transportation was by helicopter or on foot. So uh, it meant that our exploring was done very locally at Savonga town and then everywhere else by air all around the island. Um, so, so how did it, how did I end up in Savonga in July? Well, it was, um, I, it was the last aerial survey that John and I uh, worked on together. And uh, we started a flying coastline together in the early 1990s when we were working in BC and uh, we started with the biological part of the classification system 
at that time when we were serving in Guayanas. So it's uh, turned into my life's work and uh, the interpretation of the bio biological patterns and describing the habitats of coastline and starting with collecting aerial imagery at low tide. And we take video pictures and still pictures and then take the, all that imagery back to the office and classify it. So the rest of my talk, I'm, I'm really just talking about the aerial survey part. It's the funnest part. It's the most intense part. And there's a whole big data set that gets built after that. And I'll show you how to find all this information on the website. But, um, you know, I, I never would have got this Savunga if I hadn't started flying in Guayanas with John. Um, and I have to say, it's kind of like biologist torture because we go whizzing by uh, seeing all these amazing places at low tide just for a half a second. But it, it's, uh, and I take pictures of it, but it's also incredible opportunity. I always feel like I'm boasting when I say, okay, well, actually I've sh flown a lot of the shoreline. Me and John have flown a lot of shoreline together uh, from the coast of Oregon, the California border, uh, the whole outer coast of the state of Washington, most of the west coast of Vancouver Island and everything in the Broughtons. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. We've seen a lot of coastline together um, over the years. So the official definition of shore zone is an imaging and habitat mapping system collecting low altitude aerial imagery all at low tide and to classify and make maps about coastal habitat. And I included this picture that I just uh, captured off the Coastal and Oceans website. Um, and you can find out more about BC shore zone there. But we're just talking about Alaska shore zone right now. Part of the planning for our trip was to uh, understand where seal, walrus, hollows were, and where the seabird colonies were. Now, if you're a little bit disoriented, those of you that are mappers, um, I apologize on behalf of the seabird net data portal because I couldn't figure out how to turn uh, Savugak right side up, putting north up. <laughs> Anyway, the dots on the map here, this is an incredible data portal that I just found um, when I was preparing this talk. Each of those dots there is a seabird colony. And I just highlighted one on the uh, southwest corner. Sorry, it's up, it's supposed to be over here. But anyway, southwest corner of uh, Sabugak where there are almost 300,000 leased auklets and over 800,000 crested auklets, along with quite a few MERS of both types and a handful of a few hundred other things, uh, 1,400 Black Lake Kittiwake. So you'll see when we get down there that one doesn't like to fly too close to 100,000 seabirds uh, jumping off the cliff. But I'll show you some pictures of that. So here was our planned survey. You see, it's very neat. Uh, it was segmented out. Most of our the aerial surveys that we do, the low tide surveys, we usually do 1,800 or so kilometers. So this was totally uh, doable in the length of time that we had allocated. Um, this is kind of like best laid plan, best laid plans. Plus, we have to be very uh, cognizant about fuel and where to get fuel. Um, the black dots are where we had uh, fuel. So everything is timed to be flying, flying the most during the lowest tides and not waste any time refueling logistically. Um, and just as an aside, make note of Punak Islands here, they're way off the, the southeast corner. This is the, the best walrus hunting place in the Bering Sea. Um, and it's a big part of the reason why uh, the Yupik people lived on St. Lawrence Island is because of this place for walrus. 
and it's been important for thousands of years. And spoiler alert, what we actually flew <laughs> looked more like this spider web. We had trouble with uh, weather, uh, fog mostly, but also uh, strong winds and sharing the helicopter and uh, mostly fog. So we were unable to finish off these last remote places here, the big seabird colony area here. So, and um, this area of the Cape down here and we didn't go offshore to Punnett either. Okay, so finally we're underway, we're surveying. Um, and the first thing we saw in, uh, the mountains in behind uh, Savunga here as we're transiting off. So the first set of photos I'm going to show you are from the north shore of uh, Savugak from the east side um, almost all the way to the west end at Gamble. But look at these lava flows. These are cinder cones. That's why the dots on the map look like little circles is because they're they're real cones. I don't know how old this flow is but looks just as fresh as some of the things we saw in Hawaii. So we transited across to the lower side, uh, the south side of the island. And um, I started to, uh, I wrote out some of my notes from the survey day and I can read those off a little bit as, as, we, as we page through the photos here. So we lifted off about two o'clock local. Uh, we revised our plan several times and finally left after lunch, fog permitting, follow the coast inshore before cut, cutting across south to the shore at Macnick Lagoon. There were strong headwinds around the cinder cones and black lava flows. Macnick Lagoon has, lago has lagoon within lagoon within lagoon, recurve spit, amazing complex flats, uh, beach lagoons, some with beige sands, some rocky boulders, we completed about one third on the west side of Mac Nick and were pushed off by fog, nipped back across lowland to North Shore at Sipanek Lagoon, worked toward fuel at the camp at, at North East Cape. And there was a really big camp there. It reminded me of uh, Baffin. It was a deluxe pit stop, honestly, in the middle of the wilderness, nowhere. They had folded fresh white towels in the in the washroom facility. Uh, despite 25 knot winds, we continued on westward, working back towards Savunga. Amazing numbers of birds on the lava basalt cliffs at Cape Magahi. That's one of the other big seabird colonies identified on that uh, atlas I just showed you. And there was this amazing offshore pinnacle, a triple sea arch called St Strolby Rocks. It looks like a couple with their arms around each other. And this is covered with uh, MERS. There's a couple thousand MERS, thick-billed MERS and common MERS nesting there. And coming back uh, towards, towards uh, Savunga, see the rock cliffs there? And there also, if you squint there, you can see there's, um, I don't know, a few thousand MERS in this picture. They're nesting on the columnar basalt lava flows. Uh, there's kitty wake, flocks of kitty wakes there as well. And the atlas says there's uh, puffins and um, a cup, both kinds of puffins, tufted and horned, but I don't remember seeing any puffins there at all. Usually they're pretty obvious. Uh, continuing on to the west, many, there's uh, lots of old camps. Uh, these are our traditional old uh, village sites or habitations. And you can see the outer beach here. <coughs> Excuse me. Dune grass uh, on the washover bars, uh, lots of driftwood. I, we saw differences. Uh, here's more habitation here. All along here, see there's a few new cabins and then uh, buggy tracks on the way in and out. So there's no, there's no roads outside of the villages itself. So we're looking over towards Gamble here, towards the west. So if somebody wanted to, wanted to go from Savunga to Gamble, they would 
basically go overland and follow tracks in the beach. We noticed lots of differences in the lagoons, some shallow mud flats, some were really turbid. Others had other lagoon, oh, here's the dune tracks, the ATV tracks going down the barrier beach. It's like a highway. And cabins with boats up on racks there. It was impressive, the different colors in the sediment, some orange, some black, lots of uh, algal drift. And uh, these, this is a, a recurve spit pattern inside of a lagoon with a buggy tracks going across. The outer beaches are more exposed than the inner. This is a pattern that we, I've seen all over the coast is a recurve spit like this. I was thinking I would do a collection of photos of just that type, but not all the shoreline is flat. Like this is more towards the outside and you can, there's the, the tracks on the tundra. And this is persistent snow from accumulation from blowing snow in the winter. I left this photo in to show a flock of, I think it's gulls or kittiwakes here. So there were eiders uh, and a couple kinds of gulls that we saw, in, but this is what birding from a helicopter looks like. There's specks there and you can tell they're birds and some of them are, are definitely eiders and some of them are gulls. Another larger old village site with a few modern cabins around it. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll just take a pause there because I want to show you some shore zone video um, from, and I want to run the website hot. I've got it teed up here. And um, my coach is keeping me on track, which I'm grateful for. So this is, um, so does anybody have any questions at this point, Anne? There is a question about are the uh, water bodies freshwater lakes or saltwater lagoons? Oh, good question. All of the lagoons that have a barrier beach uh, to the outer, to the ocean, they would be brackish. And uh, there was definitely places where lagoons probably had eelgrass in them but you'd have to be a little ways back from the coast. So before you were in 100% fresh water. Yeah, you, could, you can tell by the vegetation, but definitely with that low lying terrain, it's, there is a gradient. But because the lagoons that are closest, closest to the barrier beaches are so shallow that they would probably be brackish just from the overwash of, of the storm waves. Yeah. Okay, well, the questions are starting to build up here, but I think probably you should continue on because none, okay. none of these are questions that you need to answer before you can go on to the next section. We'll get these at the end. Okay, so now I wanna show you the Shore Zone website. Now I'm gonna show you the splash pages first and then I'll bring the website up, which hopefully is still teed up. Uh, I think I can do all that without stop sharing too, Anne. So yeah, we'll just, just that a, go. New, a new share. I think you should be able to do that. Yeah, well, we'll see here. We'll see, I'll go through these first. Anyway, when we go to the website, this is the entry page for the website. It shows, um, uh, I already talked about the, the how to get to the website. Yeah, this is the NOAA uh, Shore Zone website front page. And if you scroll down on this page, you'll see a bunch of links to how to fly the coastline. This is the, the link we're going to follow. But there's also a bunch of tutorials that describe Shore Zone, the protocols, illustrated data dictionary. I really want to call your attention to these links here 
coastal impressions and Arctic impressions. They're two uh, gorgeous books that are put together from some of our very best uh, imagery from the Arctic coast and from the, uh, the Gulf of Alaska coast. Um, and there's a lot of other material. There's also links to all of the data summary reports. Um, and you can go and look up the one about St. Lawrence Island there. And then to get, if I clicked, I said I was going to click on this Shore Zone website. If you do that, come to this page and the start button, and you'll end up with a screen that looks like this. So this is, and this is what it'll look like. So I'm going to see. Aha, it's going to work, Anne. I have a little recording if this if this doesn't work, but I think this will work. We'll just give it a second to load here. It's thinking. Oops, shouldn't have done that. OK. I'm going to just press play here. So I've zoomed in on an area around Savunga. Can you see my cursor? It's circling the town of Savunga. Yes, we and, can see that. OK. And this, this line here, the blue dots are the recorded, uh, let's see here. The blue dots are all the photo points that I took. The yellow dots are video reference points. And the red dots are the track line of the aircraft. So we recorded our track line and all the image positions are attached to those one second fixes from the track line. So we'll see if this will run here. There we go. You might see a little camera. Here it is, the little camera coming in. So we always fly with usually with the doors off and we're looking over to the left. So in the top frame here is the video that John recorded from the back seat, and the video, uh, I mean the still photos are on the lower panel here. And they should be lining up when the video camera catches up to the still camera, then you'll see the same image there like that at the top and at the bottom. And I want to let this play there I looked ahead there at the bottom frame see I looked ahead towards the village back towards the town. These are the cliffs where all the MERS are. Uh, and we're hanging offshore a little bit because there was a terrific downdraft and crosswind it was really windy. And it's hard to tell, but the air is, is full of birds here. I'm excited this is actually working. So previously doing uh, presentations, one would never try and run the website. <laughs> It just never was fast enough, but there's been so many improvements to the technology. So this is all hosted by NOAA in, in Alaska. They were coming towards the beach. There's the whale carcass in the lower frame there. And you'll see all the boats. There's two whale carcasses. And you'll see the boats at the ramp where we walk to here. That's just coming up. There's a sewer plant with a green sign on it. I can see that looking across the town site. So this is the way I get used to looking at pictures. It's very dynamic. I want to see them all. So it was really hard to pick. We took over, uh, I'm not sure how many hours of tape we have uh, video, but. I have over 12,000 12, uh, still photos. And this, this was for a small, a small survey. A bigger survey would be twice as many. It's hard to pick best of because you know, they're all amazing. They all tell a story. So you get the picture about how incredible the Shore Zone site is. Now, you can go to the, these are totally public. You can go, you can click on the pictures that you like, download them, save them to your desktop. Um, yeah, so you can go back and look at look at your favorite spots over and over again. Okay. 
Another thing I realized as I was looking through web portals and um, we're really spoiled by Google Earth. You know, Google Earth is click, click easy, but data portals are way more complicated. <laughs> so back in Savunga, after a couple days of flying quite successfully, we had about three days where we had trouble getting out for uh, fog reasons and so on. But we were there when the crew was uh, receiving fuel from the fuel barge. There's only a couple months of open water when it's safe to do that. But here's all the fuel coming in this pipe snaking out to the fuel barge. One of the days we set off and had to come back, I thought, oh my gosh, there's been a fuel spill. But this wasn't fuel, this was the whale carcass. It was so hot. The, the whale oil was um, streaming off of the carcass. And I mentioned that there was other crews staying uh, in the village and they stayed over at the school. So you can see people's sleeping bags uh, rolled out on the floor. This is in the library, which was also the computer lab and the internet connection. And I found this amazing dictionary, uh, the, the uh, Savunga, Savukak people are Siberian Yupik people. There, there are other Yupik, there's four distinct dialects of Yupik. Um, the Siberian Yupik is more related to Asia, the Siberian side, the Russian side, than the, the rest of the US side. But this, there's a whole page here of words for different kinds of ice. So the English translation for them all is ice type, ice type, ice type. But look at that, there's a whole page of different words that mean different kinds of ice. Uh, here's a bit, another dictionary where there's illustrations. And I, I chose this page because here's Siguk, the main term for ice, what we say in English, you know, ice. So Sukak and the other ones are Sukak something, Sukak something for all the different words for ice. Here we are in the home ec room, which was the kitchen for the crews that were staying at the school. And in the background, here's uh, Derek. He's the bearing air agent. He's also the expediter official, official for uh, the village. He could get things done and MacGyver things together and kept the kept the buggies running and everything. And he offered to prepare some mangtuk. This is a uh, bowhead whale. So that's the black skin, the outer part, and the pink is the blubber inside. Um, I wasn't, I didn't actually taste it, but other people did. And also in the, the few days that we were not flying very much, there was a pocket cruiser came in. I thought this was a great juxtaposition of imagery. These are bowhead whale jawbones and an old boat in the cruise ship offshore. One of my other job, besides working for Archipelago and doing shore zone and coastal surveys, I also work as a tour guide with Maple Leaf Adventures. And so I was really interested to watch the uh, actions of the tour, tour guides getting their crews ashore. And I thought this was great. The little kids are in the, you know, waiting around with their pants rolled up. And, but the, the visitors had a special uh, show arranged at the school. It was an adventure getting everybody up from the beach and all the way up to the school. And then people assembled here with the, in the traditional dance and uh, there was drumming. They got a bunch of the visitors up here with their gumboots and uh, to join in the dancing and they also did some demonstrating of the high kick. There's a ball hanging. This was a double, double footed kicking. And look at the, the people watching the intention of it. And this woman had just done uh, the previous, um, the previous exercise, which was a one armed leg up in the air kicking. You had, you had put one arm on the floor and kicked with one foot up. She was, uh, it was incredible to see. And I wanted to include this, this little video clip here. It, it does have sound. Um, and I want you to, I want you, uh, yeah, we'll just talk about it when it's done here. 
He's picked up a pair of gloves. There's, he's got special gloves for the dads. I wanted to show that little clip um, just to uh, highlight that it, it's a living culture. So the traditional gloves are, I found um, pictures of those in the, the museum collections. It, they're specific for uh, Savugak. Um, those drums are walrus stomach drums. So yeah, this is the manifestation of the living culture. The other thing, and, um, and I wanted to show you this picture of, of Frank here, this man that's coming along. He's carrying a big piece of baleen. So every airplane that came in that was had tourists on board, uh, he would come over and try and sell the baleen to, to the visitors. At, it's just to show you how long, over four meters long. Um, anyway, I don't think this lady actually bought it, but you would see him coming along with it. Now, finally, some birds. I can hear everybody saying, oh my goodness. So I was able to uh, find a few things, a few birds around in town. I was delighted to see quite a few uh, snow buntings managed to get a couple pictures. The little, this one is either a juvenile or a, um, I've never, I've never seen them of that kind before. He's on the railing at the school. I included this one after we talked last night, Anne, because this is the best picture I could get of um, this little plover guy. I thought it looked like a semi-palmated plover, but it might actually be a common ringed plover, but the picture isn't quite good enough to tell. Yeah, I was, I was thinking it might be a common ringed. Yeah, it, it seemed to have a, the right amount of white around the face. Um, and if you look closely, there's actually a couple little sandpiper guys in here. This was the best picture I could get. But I, I was guessing um, semi-palmated uh, sandpipers. But we can come back to that one if anybody else wants to take a guess at that. But because we were in town and uh, had to stay close, but had enough time anyways, I went back, we went back out to the beach and uh, walked out towards the, the seabird colonies. Uh, Here's a better a better view of the glaucous gull next to herring gull, I think. Anybody that has corrections, please let me know. And uh, so, and this bird. Anne was correcting me last night on it. It's a black leg kittiwake. Anne says we don't usually see them with the, this uh, yellow bill in the Victoria area. But really the most abundant, abundant bird in the seabird colonies um, are these least, least auklets. And here's least auklets with the crested auklets together. I love this guy with this action shot here. And where they were nesting, 
close to town here. It was uh, not on a cliff. It was just in a tumbled scree slope. Incredible clouds of birds coming and going. That's mixed flocks of, of auklets. I don't think I've ever seen so many seabirds in one place at one time. That's the, a good view of the colony there. And I, I was able to cut a, a picture of the MERS. I don't know if these are thick billed or common. These are, are tiny little birds. And of the, uh, one of the reports of, oh, this is not a bird. Uh, <laughs> This is the uh, Alaska ground squirrel that popped up behind. John says it's called a, also called a parka squirrel. Um, anyway, of the top 20 largest seabird colonies in Alaska, four are on St. Lawrence Island. Two of them are listed as these groups of colonies around uh, Sivunga. One is at Southwest Cape and one is at Northwest Cape. There's over 3 million seabirds on, in colonies on St. Lawrence Island. 3 million on St. Lawrence Island, which is one third the size of Vancouver Island. That's incredible. And I also wanted to include a, a few pictures of um, some of the flowers. Reminded me of being in the Alpine. Um, I think that's uh, Pedicularis on the left, Saxifrage on the top, and Monk's Hood. And some type of daisy, Potentilla, Sky Pilot or Jacob's Ladder maybe. And of course I have to put in a little bit of seaweed. It was quite frustrating not being able to get down on the beach where there was lots, but this was right in front of town, which you might recognize rockweed and but there's not much of the smaller seaweed. Okay, now then we now we're going over towards Gamble, which is on the north east corner of the island. Another big seabird colony on these cliffs here. And this village is a little different than Savunga because it's it's built on a whole the whole thing is built on a a barrier washover beach. It was also historically it was a huge village, the biggest village on uh, St. Lawrence Island. And that's the airstrip for Gamble. Extremely vulnerable to sea level rise. This is flying south on the west side of the island. And it's more rugged with big mountains there. And these are the huge seabird colonies on Southwest Cape. It was quite foggy and also very windy. And we had to keep quite far offshore. It's hard to tell, but this is about uh, 15, over 1500 feet from the ocean to the top of the cliff. And we kept sliding further and further offshore because there was thousands of birds dropping out of the fog above us and it was kind of scary. In the big lagoons on the south side of the island, there's those washover beaches again. Oops. With So the question about whether it's salty or not, this would for sure be brackish because it's close to the open ocean. But those ponds further back in the back shore would probably be mostly fresh. And the reason that that John knew about cuspate spits in lagoons on St. Lawrence Island, um, he did his master's thesis on the cuspate spits in Nantucket Harbor. This is a um, a Google Earth photo of Nantucket Harbor, which is quite tiny compared to the lagoons on St. Lawrence Island. It's um, 
less than half the size, no, a quarter of the size. Anyway, this is the, the paper that describes cuspate spits on St. Lawrence Island from 1955. It's the type locality for cuspate spits. And in the figure, we actually could figure out exactly where that was. Here's a clip from the Shore Zone website and the two still the photos of that actual place. It hasn't changed much since 1955. And here's a close up of that again. There are places with lots of accumulation of seaweed, rack, wash. These are also beach cusps. You can see the ATV tracks in the back shore. Uh, in the late 1800s, there was a devastating uh, famine on St. Lawrence Island and almost all the people died of starvation and it was a terrible time. And one of the outcomes from that was that reindeer were introduced to the island about 1900. And there's huge, huge packs of reindeer now. Um, this is all the reindeer over on the snow, snow patch, probably trying to get away from the mosquitoes. And we saw these two going down the beach. Like. Uh, more wetland and lowland, incredible patterns. endless variety in the spits. And the last days that we were flying, it was it was a little bit foggy, you could looking back towards the patches. I was calling this a string of pearls, lakes, the pattern of the the ponds behind the open, the open coast and the washover bars. So really for, for me the memories of of Savugak were being present with clouds and clouds of, of the auklets. We were graciously taken care of, looked out for, welcomed, nurtured by the people of Savunga. Uh, that is an enduring memory for me. There's an incredibly strong sense of place, uh, diversity of the coastal landscape. Um, yeah, and the, just the uniqueness of the place. And I'm going to be rash here and <clears throat> end off with a moment of poetry. I heard this poem by um, Mary Oliver on CBC on the weekend, and I, I thought I'd like to read it to finish off my talk. Uh, it's called Wild Geese. It's one of her famous poems. And I was thinking I could probably... Um, revise it and every time she says geese you could just think auklet but I'll read it as she wrote it because it's her poem you do not have to be good you do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting you only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves tell me about despair yours and I, I'll, I will tell you mine Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. So thank you all um, in deep gratitude. <laughs> thank you, Mary, that was fantastic. Um, okay, so we'll open up, there's a bunch of questions in the chat, but we will open it up to uh, verbal questions, audible questions first. So if you have a question for Mary um, or comment, you could just, uh, Press down your space bar or unmute yourself and um, and jump on in. Wow. My cat wants to ask you a question apparently. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll go uh, to the, the chat and ask the questions that are in there. Seems people want to write them instead. Uh, so 
it, it, some of the questions have been answered. John's been backing you up here, but, uh, but I'll ask you some. Where would the driftwood come from? Alaska or Russia? Oh, John's coaching. He says the Yukon River, so a lot of it comes out from terrestrial sources. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of wood floating around the North Pacific too. Okay, and um, how much of the island could be inundated in storm conditions? Oh, good question. Well, it depends which direction the wind is blowing. Uh, the biggest washover beaches are on the south side lagoons. Um, I'm tempted to go back to the map to show you, but most of it would not be washed over, just right along the beach fronts there. Yeah. Right. Um, Thor, I'm not quite sure what yours says. I think I've got a misspelling in here somewhere. Um, it, you've got, it would be helpful for data gathering if Russia in Siberia. And I'm not sure what that means. Do you want to speak to it? Thor, are you still here? Uh, I, I just attended the Alaska Marine Science Conference. Mm -hmm. There was a whole session on data sharing between us uh, for marine mammal research between Russian researchers and uh, American or North American researchers. So there is cooperation across the Bering Strait. Um, nowadays, uh, the ice free Arctic and the concerns about changing ice conditions are transboundary, a global issue. Okay, so uh, another question, are, sea, are rising sea water levels a concern for the people who live there? Are, are rising sea levels? Yes, are they, are they worried about it? I skated around all that, but yeah, the coastal change in the Arctic is extreme. And that was, as soon as I saw Gamble, I thought, oh my God, these people are so vulnerable to sea level change. But the archaeological sites, uh, you remember Gamble in the background that had the big cliffs and then a flat in front. The old village sites were back, you know, they have changing sea levels historically as we have had on our coast. So, but the changes that are happening now in sea level rise is happening very fast. The shoreline is subsiding and uh, because permafrost is melting. And yeah, it's a huge issue. It's a very fragile existence. And that's really part of why I was so struck by the people of Savunga because they're the ones that are living with the accelerated coastal change. And yeah, we go back to our places in the South and they have to live with the change that's happening so fast. Okay, uh, someone noted that the remote campsites look like a series of holes. In making their camps, did they dig down and cover the excavated site with a tent structure over the top, or has the site simply sunk after the disturbance of the surface? Uh, yeah. Uh, hang on one second. I'm getting coaching some more here. I <laughs> would like to go back to the screen share, and I'll go back to a picture okay. of that. And yeah, the, can you see the screen sharing again? Yes, we can. Okay. Those are old habitation sites. I'll choose this one from Gamble. Not, John says it's not good, but it gives you the right idea. So these are places where, uh, the local people have uh, mined the archaeological sites for artifacts and they sell them. And that is why the old sites look dug up. There's a lot of old sites, as we saw a few of them, and they are, um, they're all, there's no trees or forest and there's you know, they're easy to find. So that's why they're really obvious from the air. Um, does that explain? Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. 
Okay, just a sec. I've got a lot more questions in here. Uh, someone was asking about predators. Are there foxes or other predators on St. Lawrence? That is a very good question. And I don't know. Okay. Now we didn't see any, which you'd think we would have. What about um, introduced predators like rodents? which are devastating a lot of seabird policies. That's an, colonies all over the place. I don't know about rats. It would make sense that there would be because, but you know, there's no shipping to bring them in. I don't know the answer to that one either. So, you know, John has commented that foxes could walk over the sea ice during the winter. Siberia is only 38 miles away. That's right. Well, we were just talking about polar bears wondering if, but I didn't, we didn't hear anybody say that, you know, polar bears come in the winter either, but they could. Okay, so uh, there are many, many comments here congratulating you on an awesome presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, and uh, then we have, uh, she's, Sarah says, I don't know, I know this isn't directly linked to your presentation, but you mentioned that food harvesting is strongly tied to sea ice and the marine yeah. animals that live near the ice edge yeah um, and what climate change effect climate change might have on their harvesting opportunities oh you're right huge huge effect um and in fact that study i uh quoted about the harvest of the bowheads uh recently they got two or three whales where historic five or ten years ago the average was six to ten whales so it's all to do with where the sea ice is and how close it is to shore. And that's just for the bowheads. Even more important for the people of Savugak is are the walruses. And um, walruses are strongly associated with uh, sea ice edge. Actually, all the productivity associated with the ice edge depends on the seasonality. And um, another thing I didn't mention is that there is a large ice-free area south of St. Lawrence Island. It's kind of like a wind shadow. The ice blows offshore, uh, Apollinia, which is also very important for birds overwintering and wildlife. So yeah, huge changes in the movements of the animals. And in fact, they, they have years where the ice doesn't come in. I found some pictures from a few years ago that the ice was really late. So then you get winter storms happening no animals to hunt. It's ice free. The coastal erosion is accelerated because the, the storm waves come right up, up to the shore. Right. Yeah. Uh, so there's a couple of questions about the impact the reindeer have had on the island's ecology. Uh, no, I know in, in South Georgia, for instance, they've uh, exterminated all of the yeah. reindeer because of the devastation they were having on that island. What about on uh, St. Lawrence? You know, I don't know about that one either, um, except that when uh, there were also uh, before the year before we were at uh, Svugak, we flew over, uh, we flew in the Kotzebue area, which is further to the north uh, near the Arctic Circle, north side of the Bering Strait. There were huge herds of reindeer there too. They, they brought them in as at Svugak, they brought them in and actually they're, because they're they're domesticated these are reindeer they actually ranched them and had systems for corralling and harvesting them that way and up north people didn't they didn't harvest them anymore so I I don't know how many reindeer were actually harvested on Savugak because they're traditionally marine mammal eaters so they certainly got uh, bowheads walrus and all different types of seal, but we didn't talk to anybody that got reindeer. I suppose they would eat some, but you can see the herds were quite Great. big. Um, last question. What's the predominant wind in July? Is it still oh. in the Northwest? Is there a gap wind or uh, over a gap wind over the low lying landscape? John is chuckling. <laughs> the weather is wild there. It's, I, I don't know. I know where you could find out though. <laughs> now I did send a bunch of links to Anne. Uh, 
Yes, and I have posted them in the chat. Okay. And instructed people if they want to see them to to copy them and paste them into a, a document on their own computers. Yeah. Well, go to the AUS, the A O O S dot org. It's Alaska Ocean Observing System. They have uh, live weather portals, so you could go and actually, I I had a picture of yesterday's conditions at Gamble <laughs> from yeah. the webcam at the airport there. And it also has all the weather going back. You could you can get uh, weather data to your heart's content real time. Uh, there's a couple of comments. People have provided links and comments about some of the stuff they know. There's apparently a polar bear skin hanging um, on an iNaturalist, uh, iNaturalist link uh, that had been taken several days earlier. And someone said in Kotzebue, uh, people have reindeer antlers on their roofs. If you didn't see any in the villages on St. Lawrence, likely reindeer are not hunted there. It's a good, good sign to, to watch for. Well, uh, it looks, you had over 125 people there. Um, oh, a few people are sneaking in some last minute questions here. Uh, were those wind turbines in Gamble? Were, are they using wind yeah. turbines? Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there was several in Gamble and there's several, uh, there was two at uh, Savunga it seems to me the ones at Savunga were not turning, which seems to be a common problem. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, so uh, John says that the, there are corrals, so the, the reindeers have, reindeer have been captured. Um, That's correct. Anyway, yeah. anyway uh, fascinating talk. Lots of people interested in this presentation. And thank you so much, Mary, for doing it. I hope you feel like, like your effort has been appreciated because it definitely has. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm happy to chat with anybody. I put my email address somewhere. Yeah, it's on the links that I've on I the last slide. Well. Yeah. I'm happy to chat anytime. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody. Um, we we have a, a number of events coming up next month. The, the magazine should be out shortly if you haven't already received it. Um, let's see, we've got Natural History Night is the annual general meeting. Uh, which is always very short and I think is one of the best presentations of the year because we get to find out what BHS has been doing. Uh, but then we're also having a, a presentation by uh, Catherine Bubble, who is a, a nature photographer, award-winning nature photographer, looking, presenting to us Vancouver Island Wildlife, a photo journey. That's on Tuesday, February 9th, or March 9th. Um, and Botany Night, Presentation is still to be determined, so mystery botany night coming up. Marine night on the 29th of March will be, oops, got the rolled over the wrong thing, a, a talk on um, Chinook salmon ecology in the Salish Sea. And next month's Bird, Birders Night, we're going to have uh, David Bird presenting on should Canada adopt the Canada Jay as Canada's national bird. Uh, so he's going to talk a lot on the about the quest to make the Canada Jay official. Uh, it was selected by the Canada Canadian Geographic several years ago, but the, the government of the time said that we didn't need a, a national bird. Uh, David hasn't given up. <laughs> so uh, come and join us on Birders Night on the uh, 24th of March to hear what David's been up to and how the, the quest is going. He once said that he was willing to walk all the way across Canada to, to uh, profile the Canada Jay as, as our national bird. I don't think he's done that yet, but uh, he'll, he'll have more to tell us about it. So thanks everyone for coming. And uh, thank you again, Mary, for an awesome presentation. Thanks, John, too. There's thanks for you. Love for you in the, in the chat as well. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea he was helping out in the background. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks. See you next time.